I am a health coach, a green juice drinking health coach, a fitness instructor, yogi, and aspiring yoga teacher. I encourage people to live their best life of well being by focusing on their self care and self love. I help people to reveal to themselves their untapped potential, to change their habits, and to move to a different destination in life. During the COVID 19 pandemic, I was forced to honor my inner coach. My internal voice had been telling me to be still, to take inventory of my life, to analyze my steps, and to connect with what I was feeling. To do that, I started a walking meditation. My walking meditation was to help me to get some fresh air during the pandemic, to get some exercise, to practice silence, and to practice my photography. What was surprising to me is that as I started this walking meditation, my neighborhood was brand new to me. There was so much that was unfamiliar. I noticed the magnolia trees that I walked by all the time that I had never seen before. And I walked this route all the time. I noticed the rose bushes. There were roses everywhere. It was such a great greeting to see the roses. I also noticed the flowers that were dying and that were dead. The dead and dying flowers stood out to me the most. And I took tons of pictures of dead and dying flowers. It, is, it was as if death was speaking to me through the dead and the dying flowers. I learned a lot by paying attention to death. I listened, I learned, and on March 28, 2021, I became a new kind of coach called a death doula and end of life planner. Anyone can be a death doula with some training, of course. No specific educational background is required. At its core, death work is activism designed to change the way we view death, talk about death, and the way we treat our dying. I thought a lot about death and I realized that death had called me a long time ago. As I thought about death, I considered those who were in the hospital during the pandemic, those who were alone and afraid, those who had no advocate, those who had not considered how to live life in order to die peacefully those who had regrets. I also thought about my personal experiences. One of my uncles died in his home, my uncle Jack. When he collapsed, I received a phone call for help. I rushed over to try and help resuscitate my uncle. I tried, but he was gone. I sat with his body for hours as we waited for the funeral home to pick him up. I monitored his body. I touched his hair, his skin. I kissed him. I even talked to him. I felt his presence with me. And it was such an honor to spend that time with my uncle's body. My uncle didn't want a funeral. He was the first person in the family not to have a traditional funeral. He had a memorial service. During that memorial service, there were so many stories about my uncle's love and generosity and his kindness. My uncle was respected and well-known in the community and he lived a life of service. He was a loving father, husband, fraternity brother, and obviously an amazing uncle. My uncle's legacy will always be that he was a loving presence in the world, that he was kind and generous. Another experience I remember with another uncle, my great uncle, his name is Thomas. My uncle Thomas was terminally ill. 
My mom and I went to visit him and my uncle asked me to read the Bible to him. I did. As I was reading, my uncle was crying. He had a look of despair. I didn't know why and I didn't ask any questions. I just kept reading. Later, I thought about the stories of my uncle's life. My uncle was not a kind man. His sister, who was his caretaker when we visited, was taking care of him, but he had not been kind to her. He didn't have a good relationship with his children and he had a wife, but she lived in another state. He had other siblings and though I know they loved one another, he wasn't very nice to them either. On July 9th, 1998, my 75 year old uncle, U.S. Army veteran, died at the New Orleans VA Medical Center. His funeral was a very memorable funeral for me. My uncle's body was laid out in a wooden box. I did the scripture reading at his funeral and other family members participated in the service. I learned at the funeral that my uncle is a Mason. Masons are men of character who strive to better themselves and to make the community a better place. It was good to hear about his generosity in the community and something positive about his life. At the burial site, there was a veteran gun salute, very beautiful. And I remember, though no one else in my family remembers this, I remember doves being released, symbolizing my uncle's spiritual return home. I thought about my uncle crying as I was reading the Bible to him. And I wondered why. I wondered if he had regrets about the way he had lived his life or if maybe he had not made peace with God. I also wondered why this hardworking man who loved making money and had lots of it, this person who cared about his image was buried in a wooden box. I'll never know the answers, but I learned a lot about life from his funeral. I learned the importance of forgiveness. I learned the importance of relationships. I learned the importance of legacy and self-care. That's what made that funeral beautiful to me. And that pine box, it doesn't matter because we can't take anything with us when we leave. Death doulas work with terminally ill patients or people rather to help them to tap into their inner coach. We provide spiritual, emotional, and holistic support. We coordinate care on, on behalf of the terminally ill. We work with the clergy members, doctors, morticians, estate and financial planners to ensure that the terminally ill or dying person's last wishes are honored. As I was taking inventory of my life, which is advice my dad gave me a lot as a young person because I was always getting in trouble. <laughs> but as I was taking inventory of my life, I thought about my dad and the day he died. He died four days after his 74th birthday. His birthday fell on a Thursday that year and we were home to have dinner my dad, who had many chronic conditions, didn't drink beer, but he loved beer. On that day, he decided to have a beer with dinner, and that was a great choice because that was his last beer. On Saturday, we were setting up for his birthday party, but dad got sick, really sick. Mom called the ambulance, rushed him to the hospital. I visited him Saturday evening. He was happy energetic, laughing, that gave me hope. Sunday morning, I visited again and he seemed to be okay. But by Sunday evening, my dad's eyes were barely open. 
He wasn't talking and his energy was really low. He did manage to ask my mom to go home and get some rest. And she did. Before she left, she told me he had never asked her to leave his side before. But she was tired, so she went home. I asked her if she had ever seen him look that sick before. And she said, yes, Donna, but he always bounces back. He'll be fine. That gave me hope. And I never once thought my dad would die. We were all in serious denial. My daughter and I were the last two visitors. We took pictures with my dad. We prayed with him. We hugged him. I even laid in his hospital bed with him. But we didn't realize how sacred that moment was. We didn't realize that would be our last time seeing my dad alive. My daughter and I had a 6 a.m. flight the next morning. So we left my dad alone. Before I left, and every time I tried to leave, my dad would reach his hand out and call my name, Donna, Donna. So I would go back, but eventually I knew I had to leave. Before I left, I thought about advice I had received from the former chief of staff at the VA in New Orleans when I worked there. His advice was to never leave your loved one alone in the hospital. But I thought I had to leave. I had a flight the next morning, and so I left. My daughter and I, the next morning, boarded our flight, and the minute it landed, we received the text that my dad had died. I couldn't even cry. I was just heartbroken. Fortunately, my dad did have an end-of-life plan. He knew where he wanted his funeral and how he wanted his body disposed. My dad was the second person in my family to be cremated. After my dad's service, I spent a month with my mom, helping her to sort through his things and helping her emotionally, being a support and a coach to her. When I left my mom, I went home, returned back to DC, and I grieved and cried and went into isolation and deep thought for years, trying to make meaning of the advice I had received from my dad, thinking of all the times he was there for me, forgiving myself for leaving the hospital. After I processed my feelings, I scheduled an appointment for my mom and my family and I to meet with a death doula to help coach us in preparing our end of life documents. After that meeting with the doula, I coached my mom and we prepared her love, I love you will. We prepared her living will where she designated a healthcare power, power of attorney, someone to make decisions on her behalf health care and end of life decisions if she isn't able to make decisions on her own. And we did a financial power of attorney to designate someone to make financial decisions for her if she isn't. My mom and I also planned her funeral, wrote her obituary, and then I coached my mom to facilitate a meeting with the family to talk about her end of life wishes and her death. She did a great job. After that, I realized that through my dad's death, I had my birth as a death doula. I had been functioning as a death doula, helping my mom, coaching my mom, taking care of myself. I share these stories with you to remind you that life is precious, to remind you that you can plan your death to remind you that you can heal your relationships, to remind you that death is a teacher and that death can be beautiful, to remind you that you have an inner coach, you have internal power. You can choose people to be around you to help support your values, your beliefs, and people to support your inner coach. You're able to live fully, 
die peacefully and end well. So begin with the end in mind. Think about how you want to be remembered, how you want to die, and then live accordingly. Thank you. Namaste.